Nebraska. Our speaker today is Sarah Montero Boria. She is the Director of Marketing and Communication for the Hispanic Alliance. Prior to this, Sarah worked for eight years in the Language Services Department of the Greenville Health System, first serving as a medical interpreter and then as the department coordinator. She was born in a city uh, on the border city of Tijuana, Mexico. And in 1999, she immigrated to Greenville, South Carolina with her family. She learned English through the ESL program at her high school and she continued her education and earning her BA in International Studies from Bob Jones University in 2007. In 2012, Greenville Business Magazine named Sarah one of the best and brightest, 35 and under. She is a graduate of Furman's University's Riley Institute, Diversity Leaders Initiative and Leadership Program Class of 19 I, it's blocked out. You can tell us what, what year that was, Sarah. And she served uh, board service. She's a community foundation of Greenville, the Greenville Literary Service, Public Education Partners, and Nonprofit Association. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sarah for her program today. And thank you again, Sarah, for saying yes and agreeing to speak to us all. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure. Um, I would love to see you all and be in the same room, but this is the second best. So um, thank you for making this possible and for all the coordination. Um, sure, yes. Yeah. So I, um, as Daniel stated, I am originally from Mexico, uh, but Greenville is definitely my home. Um, it took a couple of years to feel just at home here, but definitely I'm, I've been here for more than 20 years. Um, we've always been in kind of the Taylor's Greenville area. Um, I just had a baby four months ago and moved four months ago. So now we're um, kind of in the um, lake, um, what is this area called? Twin, Twin Lakes, uh, kind of uh, downtown, near downtown area. Um, so we're, I'm very, very happy in this community and thankful for just uh, what an embracing community has been for me. Um, I moved here as a teenager. So I was 14 when I came. I did not speak English. And so you can hear my accent. Uh, so just bear with me <laughs> as I speak. I'll try to be slow because uh, I do tend to talk fast. If any of you have heard Spanish speakers, sometimes we can uh, tend to speak fast. And with my accent, I know that makes it difficult sometimes to understand. So just bear with me. I do have a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation, so it should be easier to follow me also through that. Um, um, I, when I moved here, uh, again, I, as I stated, I learned English and uh, then became the, um, I started working at what now is Prisma Health as an interpreter there. I was very passionate about health access, but uh, as a volunteer for Greenville Literacy and then with Hispanic Alliance, I also understood that there are so many needs in our community beyond health. And so I came on board at the Hispanic Alliance um, in 2012, 2013, I think. Um, and I started working there as a program coordinator and now um, I focus more on the creative side on marketing and communications and I'm very passionate I, I can get to use some of my create creativity I'm, a, I'm an artist but also I get to work with our community and advocate for for the community as a whole so that's been very exciting what I'm going to present to you is something that's been on the works for I think since definitely since last year, maybe even the year prior to that. It's a needs assessment that we did in our community. Um, we interviewed 400 people and it's not, it wasn't just like a survey that you do like on a piece of paper. It was a very um, in-depth interview where we took about 30 to 40 minutes interviewing members of our community to understand the needs of the Hispanic community. For those of you who've been in Greenville for a long time, you've been, you've seen how it's changed. Even for me, when I came in 99, I saw how the population changed and it grew very fast. And so that had different challenges, obviously for, for community, for, for providers of services, but also for the Hispanic community. So for example, a mom that may have come in the early 2000s and needed to know where to register for her child, or her child for school, 10 years later, 15 years later, would have different challenges. You know, by now, maybe she's had one, two, three kids, and she knows where to go to take her child to, to get registered for school and knows the teachers and can navigate the school system well, but maybe they have questions about college, right? So that's why we need we did this needs assessment to understand the needs in the community so that it wasn't just what we thought or what we have heard, but really hearing from community members about this. And we did this in partnership with Furman actually. So let me start uh, presenting my screen and I will tell you a little bit more about Hispanic Alliance and then the needs assessment, I'll go in depth. Any questions you have, um, 
I think I would love to spend more of, more of my time answering any questions, actually, because the presentation, you know, sometimes data, I'll try to make it as exciting as I can, but, um, you know, it's data. So, all right, let's jump in. So, let's see over here. This is the mission of the Hispanic Alliance, to foster collaboration between people, resources, and cultures to build a more thriving Greenville. Uh, we envision a vibrant community where everybody has access to opportunities and prosperity. You know, it's called the Hispanic Alliance, but it really is not an alliance of Hispanic people. It's an alliance of people who serve the Hispanic community, perhaps, or are interested in the Hispanic community. And some of them happen to be Hispanic, but really our network is very diverse, I would say, the minority of folks are maybe Hispanic. Um, it's mainly people who are serving, a lot of folks are kind of service providers. So you think anywhere from people who are working in healthcare or education, um, pastors, business owners, that's really kind of what our alliance is made up of. And that's a network that I was telling you about. We have network meetings every month. Unfortunately, you know, since March, everything's had to be virtual. And I say unfortunately, just because so much of, of a network meeting is actually like shaking hands and getting to know each other and talking. And that's been something that we're learning still how to do via Zoom. So um, our community teams also meet monthly. And those are smaller meetings. Uh, our network meetings usually were anywhere from 50 50 people, I would say on average, our community teams were made up of just like 10 or 20 people. And those are still working well with Zoom. With volunteers, you know, everything's changed also, uh, our events are not happening. So our volunteer base, our volunteer base has also changed, um, but they're still very active. We focus on just four areas, um, health, education, financial stability, and legal. And those are the areas that we kind of focus our work. There's definitely some things also in the arts category, but um, focusing our work in these four areas makes us more efficient. And for the volunteers that we have too, because all of the work that we do in our community, um, while we help facilitate it, it's actually done by volunteers. We also have um, a group of students from Carolina High School and Berea High School. Um, these pictures were taken before COVID um, in 20, actually this year, this school year, we're actually not um, getting together with, with the students. Um, it's just not a responsible thing to do. It's also not something that was feasible. And so we're actually just, um, uh, this year, we're focusing on reaching out to our alumni and making sure they're connected and they're all of them graduated and all of them when they leave our program are connected to a college and have a plan for college. Um, so we're kind of reaching out and doing that work this year. And now I'll jump in into the section that you're here for, the Hispanics in Greenville, which is the needs assessment that I was mentioning to you guys about. Um, so I'll start with a demographic profile. Um, Hispanics make up 60, um, 60 million actually in the United States as a whole. Um, in South Carolina, um, there's over 300,000 folks. And then Greenville County, it's 50,000 people. So that's 9.5% um, of the population as assessed here. Um, nationwide, we are the largest minority. Uh, in Greenville County, um, it's only again 9.5%. And the growth in that has really tapered off. In the early 2000s, it grew a lot because of immigration. Now, um, since 2008 um, has been more, actually since before 2008, uh, that's kind of when the economic crisis that we had in 2008 happened. And that's when you started seeing the, the, the growth rate really taper off because births are also kind of slowing down. So the Hispanic population has really, that percentage has really remained in that 8.5, 9.5% for a couple of years now because immigration has definitely slowed down and then birth rates are also very, um, are very tapered. So that's the population uh, estimate for for us currently. Now, if you look at schools, um, which we'll get into education in a minute, the percentages are a little higher. 15% of kids in Greenville County schools are Hispanic. So because the Hispanic population tends to be young, um, you got a younger segment of the population that's Hispanic. I thought that you may be interested in this, uh, kind of the breakdown, <laughs> the nation of origin. Uh, a lot of folks used to think that, oh, if you're Hispanic or Latino, you're Mexican, but obviously um, that's not the case. I happen to be Mexican, so I'm helping that, that generalization, I guess. But in Greenville County, actually, there's a big part of the population that's Colombian. I don't know if you guys are aware, if you've seen maybe the Colombian restaurants, or if you've met people who are from Colombia, perhaps. Um, but it's a very interesting history. I don't know how many of you know this, but... Um, the, the reason why we have a strong Colombian heritage in, in Greenville County is because of the textile mills. So um, back in the 60s and 70s, we actually recruited from Colombia folks to come and work in the mills. 
because that was an industry that was very um, just booming in Colombia. And so you got people who were skilled who came and worked, um, which means that if they immigrated here in the 60s and 70s, um, they settled here and had their families and maybe brought a, an uncle or brought a cousin or maybe a single person came and eventually let, you know, their, their loved one was able to come immigrate here and, and then had a family. So uh, it's a very neat thing. You know, I am a first generation immigrant. I came here as a teenager, like I said, but I'm kind of jealous of, of some of the Colombian immigrants who are now third generation, you know, their grandparents, um, kids, and then kids who have children. So it's really neat to see that that Colombian immig immigration here. And it's unique to Greenville. It's not something um, I would say over 20% of Hispanics in Greenville are Colombian. And if you look at nationwide, it's the Colombian percentage nationwide, it's like 4%. It's not even a thing in the census almost. It's, it's so small. So it's something very unique to our community. And then the rest is made up from folks from Central America and definitely Puerto Rico and, uh, you know, a Puerto Rico and, uh, and folks are actually U.S. citizens, but they also consider Hispanic. Um, and yeah, you can see kind of some of that breakdown there. Let's go to the next slide. Um, before I get into some of the kind of data, which by the way, I can share a link with you where you can see the whole report with much more information if you're interested. But this is a very important slide that I want to share with you that's a little more qualitative than quantitative. Um, and it's very important to me. So, okay, so picture the, the social status as a ladder. And at the bottom, you have folks who are very, what you can picture and maybe the lowest social status you can picture. Somebody with um, maybe literate, absolutely no education, maybe somebody who's unhoused, um, who has no resources, financial resources to speak of. Um, and then you keep going up the ladder and at the top of the ladder picture somebody who has just incredible wealth, what you would consider to be just the highest social status. And again, it's wealth, it's education, access, property, anything you think like that. That's what we asked uh, our, our participants to picture. And then we ask them, based on that picture that you have, where do you consider yourself to be in Greenville? Okay, so let's start in Greenville. Let's start in that green area. 60% of our respondents said they consider themselves, and 76% said they consider themselves in the upper rungs of the ladder. 18% uh, said they were in the middle, and 6% said they were at the bottom. Um, and then you can see here we asked for... Um, the United States. And then the important thing is in, in your country of origin, so everybody, everybody we interview is a, an immigrant, where do you see yourself on the ladder? What did you see yourself in, in Mexico, let's say for me, did you see yourself in the lower end or in the upper end? And so you can see here how folks definitely consider themselves, they came from a very rough uh, background where they didn't have access and just coming to the United States has made them feel like they're at the top of the ladder. And I say made them feel because quantitatively we're gonna get into earnings. You can see that literally folks are not at the upper end of the rank, <laughs> in the upper end of the ladder. You know, they're not earning what we would consider to be kind of the upper end, but they see themselves as doing very well, which is very important um, for the well-being of these families and their children. So I just think this is a very moving, again, it's more qualitative as far as the data we're going to see, but it's just such a, it means a lot. I think it just speaks to gratitude and um, just the perception they have of how they're performing, um, which I think it's, yeah, it's just beautiful. All right, so let's jump into education. These are split into four. We're going to do education, um, health, uh, financial stability and, and legal access. So we're, I'm going go to try to go through these fairly fast. So I mentioned to you, definitely Hispanic population tends to be young. 15% uh, of kids in Greenville County schools are Hispanic. And here you have uh, the breakdown of that. Of our families, 33% um, of them have one high school age child. Uh, something that's quite concerning for us and where we focus a lot of their work is that only 80, 88%, which is a big number, said that they know very little about the college application process, uh, nothing or only some. And this is where we're focusing a lot of their work because as I said, our community is kind of aging. And so with that, it means, it means different concerns. And we know that in the United States, um, definitely you have outliers who are very successful with our college education, but we understand that education is very important to succeed. Um, and while uh, work ethic is something that's just innate to the immigrant community overall, the focus on education and higher education is something that we're really working on because a lot of times families are focused once a child is done with high school, they're so eager to get them to earn money so they can help with the family 
um, expenses that they sometimes encourage them to work right after high school. And we all know that, yes, you can work and go to school, but it's, it's a challenge. And so we need families to be able to support um, that dream of, of higher education. All right, let's go to health. Um, a lot of our community is not insured either because that's something that they can do uh, with work or because they're undocumented. Um, over here, you can see that 61% of our participants um, have no health insurance, and that definitely follows the metrics for what we know US um, nationwide and statewide that immigrants usually have no insurance. All right, as far as uh, options for people who don't have insurance, um, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, they just, people just go to the ER. Well, in Greenville, we have a lot of um, really good services for people so that they just don't go to the ER. Uh, I mean, obviously the ER is there for when it's actually an emergency, but you have places like um, New Horizon Health um, Services or the Greenville Free Medical Clinic um, or different clinics now that are private where people can pay out of pocket and, um, you know, an affordable, affordable alternative for people. So that's where the majority of our folks go. Um, some people here go to uh, clinics that are free of charge. And then um, this uh, 24 rely on the ER and then 21 just have a private provider. Um, this is um, when it comes to children and insurance, just so you are aware of this, if, if the children were born in the US, they're able to qualify for, for insurance. Um, but over here, you see that 18% of families who have children still don't have insurance for their children. And that's a concern for that, for them. Um, this is information about where the children go when they don't have insurance. Uh, some of them go to the ER. Um, and you can see that there. Now, dental care, that's something that's a concern for all populations. It's not just the Hispanic community. Um, all populations um, have, a, have a challenge when it comes to affordable health care. Um, only 50% of our participants actually saw a dentist, um, which is, you know, that's something that um, definitely is a concern for our community. Half of them have insurance and half of them pay out of pocket. Um, thankfully, uh, majority, even though it's still only 78% of kids have regular um, dentist access. When it comes to financial stability, um, the median house come, household income in, in the U.S. is 58000 um, The Hispanic median income nationwide is 48000 um, And 81% of Hispanics in Greenville li live at or below 50000 50, um, So that's something that still kind of trends nationwide. You can see here a breakdown of the household income for participants. Now, 43% of people uh, earn less, less than, than $25,000. That number should matter because it goes, it contradicts the picture that they have of themselves on that ladder that I was telling you about, which I, again, I think is very powerful. It speaks to, um, <laughs> I just, you can tell it's, it's something that I'm passionate about, but it speaks to hope, right? Okay, maybe right now I'm not doing very well, but I'm definitely doing better than I was doing before I came here. And I think I will continue to do better and my children will do better. So I think that's something that's uh, very powerful and I wanted to share with you because while like tangibly you can see there that folks are not earning very much, um, the majority of them perceive, perceive themselves as doing well. All right, 53% of participants own their own business. Um, this is very important, I think, for immigrants. You see that definitely there's an enterprise spirit um, that is very much like, you know, the American spirit to kind of do your own thing, um, uh, come up with ideas. And that's something that we see in the Hispanic community, just uh, people starting their own businesses, whether informal or formal. I think all of, for, for those of you, again, who've been here for a while, you've seen the growth of not just Mexican restaurants, but Latin stores, right? Um, and then with that come so many other services that we're seeing in Greenville. And the Hispanic Alliance has been focusing on that this year. We started two years ago, trying to highlight some of the Hispanic entrepreneurs that are just changing the landscape of our community. Um, when I joined the Hispanic Alliance eight years ago, that wasn't really a priority, but we've seen that grow so much. So many people, you know, as, as people have gotten settled or as young people have grown, um, they start doing, you know, things like insurance or um, a florist shop. There's just so many different businesses that, that are kind of booming well i guess with covid has has been a challenge but before covid um, they were booming and growing and so um, we want to make sure we highlight that to inspire other people other hispanic people to also open their own businesses and also to kind of inform the community as a whole about what the 
Hispanic community and immigrants are doing. And then this is the last section on legal. Um, uh, this is important to folks who are, you know, attorneys or in, in, in that area of, of legal, but one in three of our participants has used legal services in the U.S. Um, something I'll just highlight here, you see here the word notary and attorney, okay? Um, a notary in Mexico and in most Latin countries is a term that's higher than an attorney. A notary in Mexico, for example, is somebody who functions as an attorney as an, and as an accountant. Um, so for example, when I told my mom uh, in Mexico that I was a notary, they were just so proud. They acted like that was like a college degree. And you and I know that a notary is just something you go to downtown and you sign a form and you send it in. Um, it is something important, but it's not something that's like a doctorate or somebody who's, you know, just past the bar, which is the way is seen in other countries. So uh, people use that to exploit immigrants. So they will uh, advertise themselves as notaries. And uh, obviously, you know, notaries can do some things. And a notary is really just a formal witness. So, but they abuse this and um, advise people on legal issues, provide immigration services. And that is something that's a big, we, we've been trying to educate the community on this for many years, um, just that notaries are not notarios um, in, in the sense in Latin America. Uh, but it is a very dangerous thing. And so that's why we have this as part of the train of, of this uh, presentation, just to share how people um, are still going to notaries for things that they should not be going to. And, and so many stories of people losing thousands of dollars because a notary told them they could do something, um, which was not the case. All right, have other respondents um, have used immigration, uh, have used legal services for immigration purposes. Um, and then 18% has been more for family issues like divorce and child custody. Only 2% of our participants have been to court on criminal or um, court proceedings. Uh, this is about law enforcement. So 14% of our participants have reported being the victim of a crime, 84% of them. So the majority called the police and the majority also 85% said they would feel comfortable um, calling the police. 88% believe they would tre be treated fairly. I think that speaks highly of our um, police department and the sheriff's office here in, in, our, in our area, um, that they have definitely tried to build a relationship with the community and that there has no been... A, I know there are issues with um, with minorities, but at least in the immigrant and Hispanic community, um, you know, we're reporting here what they're stating, which is that they feel like they would be treated fairly if they needed that. So I think that's, again, that speaks highly of our um, police department and the sheriff's office. Uh, of the people who would not feel safe calling the police, 75% of them are undocumented. However, 75% of undocumented individuals would feel uh, safe calling the police. I hope that makes sense there. All right, so this is when it comes to legal documents like uh, like a will or a power of attorney, a large majority you can see here have no plans, no legal plans. Uh, and this is very dangerous because if a lot of our folks are undocumented, if they were to be deported or something like that happened, their children, um, it would be, it'd be it'd just cause a lot of problems because there would be no plans for their children. Uh, and this happened, um, 2010, 2008, I want to say, there was a raid, I think, oh, yeah, I think it was in the early 2010s, 20, 2012, something like that. There was a raid at the chicken farm over here on Rutherford Road, and the um, migration picked up a lot of people. Well, you had children then who needed to be picked up from school who were not picked up by their parents because they were being held. So it definitely caused a little bit of a humanitarian crisis here with, with children and with um, moms who were left. Um, and so this is something that we try to educate our community on, making sure you have a power of attorney, making sure you have legal documents and a plan in place. And this is where I'm kind of wrap, wrapping up this presentation. And I, again, there's only so much we can look at when it comes to numbers. I will, make, I will um, send Daniel the link to this report. It was a printed report, which I'm happy to mail to you if you would like, but um, online we have a, a version that you can kind of scroll through, not scroll, um, turn the page on like virtually and you can you can get to see this report. Um, but I, I wanna be sensitive to the fact that not all of us like looking at percentages for very long and now just um, give the rest of my time for questions or anything else you guys would like to discuss. I'm muted here, okay. Uh, first question, let me get back to my chat screen here. 
Hispanics make up 9.5% of Greenville County. Does that include undocumented or what percentage of the nine, and also what percentage of the 9.5% is undocumented? Good question. Yes, it would include, according to the, the, the way the census tracks this information, it does include undocumented populations. It'd be very interesting to see what happens after the census we had you know, in 2010, because these numbers, you got to think that the farther you get away from the census, the less reliable the data becomes. And the numbers I showed you, I want to say, initially we had 2016 numbers, but then in preparation for this, I updated that section. So that was 2019 data, um, which is good because it's the most up to date. But again, the farther you get away from the census, the the less reliable the information comes. So it'd be very interesting to see what happens after the census that we had last last year. Um, but yes, that data does include undocumented uh, populations. And let me see. I think from our report, which does track well with, um, with the, some of the nationwide figures. Let me see if I can find that on here. I know I have that somewhere. And I'm happy to send that to you, but I want to say it was about half of these these folks were um, have no um, no status, which would mean um, not residents and not U.S. citizens. Now that doesn't mean that they wouldn't be. Here we go. Let me see if I can find that. And I will um, I will I will put this on my screen right now. Uh, share no. I'm so sorry. Give me 30 seconds. Less than that. I can do it. I can do it. Here we go. Percent. And then do a share. Share screen. Here we go. I got it. Can you see that screen? Yes. Okay. So here's a breakdown of that that you'd want to see. Um, This is according to the, the respondents that we had. And again, this tracks very well with what other numbers show. 17% um, were born in the US, 12% were nat nat naturalized, which is people like me who became US citizens. I, um, I became a resident via, with my, via my dad. Uh, I was a child and he uh, asked for me to, to start that process. And so that took about five years. And then after I became a resident, I waited five years and then I became a US citizen right before I turned 18. So um, we made it happen right before I turned 18. It's, it's easier if your father starts up or your parent asks that process for a child. And then, um, yep, yeah, so I've been a US citizen for a while and uh, my husband is uh, from Michigan. Um, so we were part of that data that's, uh, you know, I guess a, a mixed <laughs> family here. Um, 17% at legal residents, which would usually be, you know, a, a resident who uh, you can do many things, um, but you're still not a US citizen. And then 30, 36% are undocumented. So that would mean nothing, no visa, no work permit, no DACA. And DACA is a program for only youth. Uh, yeah, so you can see that breakdown there. Can you tell us something about the demographics of your sample, not just the legal residents, but uh, the, you know, the age groups, you said meant they're, they're younger than the general population. Could you go into that in a little further detail? Oh, sure. And let me, so I'm, what I'm showing right now on the screen is the, um, the, the, the giant presentation we did when we launched this. Um, so let me see if I can find that for you. Um, I'm glad you guys are interested in this information. I didn't want to have too much on here, but I'm very happy to answer those questions. Um, I thought I had an age breakdown on here. All of the people who we sampled were adults. I don't see the age breakdown, but everyone who we sampled were adults. Um, and so they spoke on behalf of their families but I don't see the information on the, on the age breakdown. Um, but I'm happy to, to look that up and, and share it with you. I know we, I've, I've shared that information for presentations before, but not for this, for this. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to look that up and, and just send you the breakdown of the kind of the, you can see that like we, we trend very young. And then as you're looking towards the senior citizen category, there's less, um, 
less of, of, of people in our community, uh, which I, you know, we, we've definitely made efforts. I know that we spoke with Senior Action at some point to see if we could do some activities for our folks who may be at home, who need to get out and about. Um, and it's something that we have not been able to, to achieve, but um, yeah, our, our Hispanic community usually trends younger. Uh, can, you mentioned that you became a citizen just before you turned 18 and that your dad had come here. Did you all come as a family? or did he come ahead of you yeah so that's a really good question because i'm he we came together my parents are divorced so i actually came with my brother and my dad and we all the three of us came together because we are from the border um all my life i've been able to kind of go back and forth usually just for the weekend so we would cross where we call the other side we always call the us the other side um so we would say you know, we're gonna go to the other side this weekend. And that usually included us going uh, shopping to like a bodega, which is, I don't know, I guess like a very small Costco. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it looks like a Costco, but it's very small. Um, and then we'd get like things in bulk, like rice and beans uh, and giant block of cheese. And then we'd stop at Church's Chicken <laughs> sometimes and get, a, we'd get corn. I don't know why, I never ate chicken at Church's Chicken. I only, we only got corn corn on the cob. Um, and then sometimes if we were uh, spending more time there, we'd get, uh, we'd go to hometown buffet. And that was my only experience with the U.S. <laughs> that was it. I would go to hometown buffet, um, do grocery shopping, like big bulk grocery shopping. Um, my, my grandparents, um, my grandmother sewed clothes and my grandpa sold them. So we'd also go to, um, actually, interestingly enough, like um, to Korean shops and in, in Middle Eastern kind of district where they would sell fabric. And, and my grandmother would buy fabric there. And that was my only experience with the US growing up was very transactional. Mm -hmm. um, but my father did do some work in California in the eighties uh, and he was undocumented. Um, and through um, a Reagan uh, bill that passed in 89, uh, Simpson, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting the name. I remember Simpson Scully or something like that. There was a, a bill that was passed. Um, and so he became, he was able to gain, gain uh, legal residency through that bill. And so he became a resident. And then the years he became a U.S. citizen. And I mean, he's, um, he's such a proud American U.S. citizen. Um, and I am too, but um, like I said, he's, he's just in Mexico right now and he sent me a picture and he has like a, a, an American flag, um, uh, like mask, but, cover thing and I'm like well I don't know well, he's in Mexico and I'm like maybe you shouldn't be wearing that but I'm sure he's safe but um he yeah we're very very proud American citizens and he um so he asked for me that way uh, which is something I'm passionate about if we had immigration reform that that we could agree on I feel like that would help so many people for them to have the opportunities that I had because the, the opportunities that I had um while I try to apply myself a lot of that was just the doors that were open for me and in my work, I see kids who are way brighter than I am, smarter, better children, <laughs> you know, better daughters, um, work harder. I worked, I mean, I worked since I moved here. I worked since I was 15, all, every summer uh, and during the week sometimes. But I see kids who are working full time while in high school. Um, so very kids that are very hardworking and they don't have that door open for them the way I had the door open for me. So that's something that's heavy on my heart. Okay, and that I'm assuming is a big issue. And uh, what do you do? You have any thoughts, or how are you, how is the Hispanic Alliance going forward, working towards this? Uh, what do you do? You, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but do you have any thoughts, or uh, what's going to go, proceed in the half in the future? I I don't know what the future holds. You know, with with just COVID and some of the challenges we had in 2020. Um, we haven't been focused as much on immigration reform, but before that, we definitely were working with youth. So a lot of our work is, uh, well, again, I was mentioning with the Carolina high school students and the Berea high school students. Um, you know, Berea is a, a, sec, a section with a, a high segment of the population that's Hispanic. And so our kids, and I wanna say 40% of kids in Berea and 40% of the kids in, in Carolina high are Hispanic. You don't quote me on the exact numbers, but that's about their range. Mm -hmm. And so we focus a lot of our efforts with them. And now a lot of them, most of them are U.S. citizens. Um, this is an old number, but 92% of the kids who are Hispanic in Guillermo County schools are U.S. citizens. So I don't want to paint this like dire picture where like they're all undocumented and struggling um, because the, the large majority of them are U.S. citizens. And so they will have, you know, they can be presidents if they want to. Um, and so um, 
that's something that's improving every every year that goes by more of children are US citizens, but then the people who are undocumented that are kind of aging out. Um, and so that's why I mentioned earlier, a lot of our efforts are on educating families and preparing them for college because they can qualify for for college and for some of the support financial support that you know exists in South Carolina. So that's a lot of our efforts are. Okay, one of the quite I think you sort of answered this next question. Do most of the Hispanic children start school speaking English? I know you said you didn't speak English when you started. So uh, do you know what that percentage is here? Um, I can look that up. I will tell you, no, the large majority of them are still starting school not speaking English. Now, thankfully, there's early interventions. You know, you have Head Start and you have um, ESL when they start out. So that's kind of how they're getting in to the school system, learning English. Kids, especially young kids, pick it up so fast, so fast. And my brother was four years younger than I was when we moved here and he like spoke English. He learned it much quicker than I did. Mm -hmm. um, probably in, like his first couple of months, he was already speaking English fairly well to speak to other students. Um, however, you're seeing people, you're seeing now a segment of population kind of like me who came or, or, or um, came when they were younger. And so now they speak, the parents are bilingual. And so the kids are going to be bilingual um, just because they're, that's kind of the, what the household looks like. So that's something to consider. Um, you, you definitely had immigrants who came who didn't speak English, who had children who then didn't speak English. But as a population changes, um, you are having people who grew up in Greenville, who are bilingual, who now are raising families and are raising bilingual children. Are you going to raise your child bilingual? I'm trying. Yeah, definitely. I, I thought I would do my best to only speaking Spanish to her so that and then my husband would speak English, but it's really hard. Um, so I'll definitely speak both both to her. She's um, yeah, she's little. So, you well, know. Yes, yes, yes. OK, but uh, I want to. All right. We at Ali are always trying to get people uh, to, to to come to Ali. And this is one that we, oh, there you go. You can show that off, absolutely. What's her, what's the, is it a boy or a girl? I didn't know. It's even, a little girl. A little girl, and what's her name? Um, Paloma. Paloma, P-A-L-O-M-A. Okay. It means dove in Spanish. All right. Um, we tend to assume that older Hispanics don't speak English and that they would not be interested in Ali. Uh, is this correct or is this one of our uh, assumptions that uh, we should not assume that way? I think that's definitely changing. I, you're probably right on the, the majority that maybe that's the case. Um, we had a volunteer with us who we adored. His name was Elkin. Um, and he was one of the Colombian immigrants that I told you about that came in the 70s. Um, he came, I want to say, 68 to work in the mills and... Um, and stayed here to make his family here. And he volunteered with us through the AARP program. He passed away two years ago, but um, he spoke English fluently. The, the only thing is that he had a strong accent. And so when he would start talking to people in English, it would take them like, I could always see like, just like a 10 second delay and be like, oh, this gentleman speaking in English to me because his accent was so strong. But I think, no, I think, um, I think that's changing. I think definitely more folks are, are bilingual. Also you have people moving here, right? The way you're seeing people move here from other parts of the state. There's also Hispanic people moving from other parts of the state, other part of the country, sorry. And so you're seeing people from, you know, Florida or New York or California moving here who are, you know, they've been in the U.S. their whole lives. And so they, they are bilingual. Um, so I think that's changing. Okay. Well, one of the things you could do for us and for Ali and for your Hispanic population is make them aware of our Ali uh, organization and the lifelong learning opportunities we have here because we have a committee that is trying to get the Ali to be more representative of our community. And it's very difficult because uh, until you know how to reach people of a different uh, uh, group, it's hard to get them to, to, to participate. And uh, it's a wonderful program. We can all who are watching and participate in it can attest and we'd love to have a more diverse group out here. Um, any other questions uh, from uh, anyone else out there? Okay. 
Uh, do you participate much? My wife for years taught at uh, Legacy Early College. Is that one of your programs also? Yeah. yeah, we've always, we've been connected with Legacy since I started working here. They used to be a print, they had a principal who has Hispanic um, and now he's in a different school, Ed Roman. Um, and yes, we've done trainings there and definitely do different um, events with the community there. And City View, who's that, that's that, well, City View and Monaghan, Mon I don't know how to pronounce that, but those are the neighborhoods there. And we had uh, for many years uh, with Bon Secours San Francis uh, outreach at City View, um, reaching out to the Hispanic neighbors there, because that's definitely uh, a little bit of a, Kind of gentrification that's happening like you have hispanic families moving there and kind of renovating the houses and doing what they can mm -hmm. uh, buying them for very affordable prices and then kind of flipping them and, and living in city view so that's been a very um important outreach that we, we did we haven't been there in a little while but um definitely that's one of the important communities i saw a question here yep. uh, from jessica justice yep. what are some of the ways that the community can get involved increases access to his university for hispanic youth there's definitely the work that we do um, supporting it either financially or but with volunteering um, and you can learn a little bit about that on our website and then it's also the there's the um, Hispanic American Women's Association. I've been a volunteer with them for many years. They've been doing this work for more than 20 years and all they do is scholarship scholarships for Hispanic students. That's all they do. They're all volunteers, uh, all of them women. Um, the men definitely support, uh, but it's all women. And they do, well, before COVID, they did events um, to try to raise funds for Hispanic students. Um, and last year they did some virtual efforts and and I think they raised actually more. So that was interesting, but um, they started with like a scholarship of $500. And then now they're, I think we gave about $25,000. Um, very rigorous, very well-documented pro, uh, program for scholarships that they have. Um, so I definitely recommend that. I'll type it on here, the Hispanic American Women's Association. Yep. Could you comment on the um, COVID crisis in the Spanish community? Sure. Uh, read yeah, that, that it's was severe there. Was some dark times earlier, well, kind of last year, um, uh, a large segment, I think at some point, 40% of the cases at Memorial uh, were Hispanic people. So that's really high because if we only represent 9% of the population, but you have 40% of the cases at Memorial, that's that was a big concern. I'm happy to report that that's improved a lot. Um, and again, that's just data for Memorial. Um, and that was only for like a one week period, but it's still something that was scary. Um, I don't know, we don't know if it's something cultural that people are just like, maybe weren't taking it seriously or, or the fact that like you have big families living on their one roof. Um, and so it's very hard to kind of quarantine from each other, but that was definitely something that uh, was a big, um, you know, cause for worry last year. Um, and at the beginning, some of that could be um, attributed to a language access issue, you know, as, as the information is getting out there, maybe DHEC doesn't have all the materials, but I'm really, I'm really pleased with how far um, organizations like Prisma, Bon Secours, um, DHEC, um, all of their materials are in Spanish and in English, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them are in Spanish and in English. You have services like PASOS, um, I'll type it right here, there's an organization called PASOS doing great work in the community they are um they work with prisma or they are within prisma and they have uh three people on staff i want to say in greenville who are just doing outreach um and i mean really Kate, like a lot of case management to get people educated um so my hat's off to them uh, pasos has been a great partner doing at the beginning again like covid uh, screenings and now I'm, I'm sure they've transitioned into vaccine services and things like that but they're they just they deserve an award on my on my book. They, they've done great work. At some point, one of them got COVID from just, I mean, she was so exposed and trying to reach people out in the community that she herself was in the hospital for a while. Um, but yeah, they've done great work. Okay. Well, if we have no other questions, Sarah, we're going to let you go. We thank you very much for coming. It's wonderful to actually see you and get to meet you. You're a neighbor of my daughter. You're, she lives in the same community you, uh, that you live in. So it's a very nice community, I can tell you that. So thank you for coming. It was very informative. And uh, if you have that, your information, you could send that to Jessica and she'll see to it. It gets into our Ollie notes and then we can share it with the rest of the people. 
And thank you again for coming. We appreciate your time and saying yes to us. Thank you. I appreciate you. It was great seeing this, the, the few of you I can see. So have a great day and a great week. All right. You too. Bye-bye.